Uh, this research um, is, is currently being undertaken, so these are kind of initial thoughts. Um, and I'm doing it alongside a colleague, which is Dr. Tom Fletcher, not the Tom Fletcher I share an office with, which is endlessly confusing. Um, we call him the false Tom Fletcher, just to make that distinction. Um, so I'm going to start with um, um, a vignette, because um, it's a good word. Um, and this is, <laughs> this is Tom Fletcher here with um, Lizzie and Ruby. And he says that this is our everyday experience of walking. Each day is a little different in terms of who we are, and who we meet, where we go, what we see. But this is only part of why we do it. For Lizzie, Ruby and myself, the walk is an important aspect of our relationship, not as owner and pet, but as family. This paper will be presenting some initial thoughts in relation to an ongoing research study into dog walking practices. The research is being conducted by myself and Tom. Um, and after meeting at the 2013 Leisure Studies Association conference and chatting about our respective hounds, we got to thinking about how we integrate dogs into our own, um, into our lives, um, and both being with, from um, a leisure studies um, background, specifically, we began to question whether the time spent with our pets was leisure or it was something else. I will begin by briefly outlining some work that's already been undertaken into dog walking ownership leisure experiences in order to set the scene and outline the gaps in the research that we're looking to fill. I will then explain um, what we mean by leisure without taking up too much time. Um, and address the complexities of the notion, and then I will then address some of the initial thoughts and how we propose to take the study further. Um, so that <laughs> um, it's just kind of scoping the subject at the moment. We're going to just do five interviews each and then see what happens. So it is a really small scale study, all in our own time, for the love of it, basically. For the love of dogs, basically. Um, so, um, considering dogs. Um, according to research conducted at the same time of the census in 20, um, 2007, 31% of UK households are home to a dog, and 11% of UK census respondents in 2011 admitted to listing their dog as their son on the survey. <laughs> Yet our relationship with these pets is relatively um, under-researched from a sociological point of view, and even less research has been conducted on how dog ownership and leisure practices intersect. Much of the work on dogs and leisure and tourism comes from uh, Australia and the US. The work of Carr and Cohen um, in Australia explored the gap between the desire to take a dog on holiday and the actualisation of that desire due to the lack of facilities. There has been a tension on the participation of agility and other dog related activities and this is often classed as serious leisure and this is from a US perspective. Here most notable findings relate to the clash between real, wo real world duties and dog leisure sport activity and the negotiation of this in particular relation to gender with the overwhelming participants um, of, in dog sport being women. The remaining um, literature tends to focus on the value of dog ownership in relation to physical and mental well-being. Again from an Australian perspective, Kurt et al conducted extensive literature review which concludes, not surprisingly, that dog ownership produces health benefits but there's a lack of research on the policy environment which might constrain or enable dog walking. Quantitative studies dominate in this area with the work of Peacock and Clark Klein being two recent examples in psychology. Clark Klein's study found that women and single adults found most psychological benefits from dog ownership. Again, in Australia there are some emerging qualitative studies in this area with Degling and Rock finding a more complex relation between um, comparing for a dog and physical relationship. Um, they find that the, the relationship between physical activity and dog, um, having a dog is much more ambiguous and contingent. More pertinent to the work that we're going to do um, around, is around personal sociology, animal-human relations and the notion of the post-human. I'm going to return to that notion in a moment. Power, again, from an Australian point of view. Sorry, turn the page, not the slide. Um, and from a geographic approach, has explored the work of the domestic setting um, and dogs and family members. She coins the interesting phrase, more than human families, but highlights the difficulties in articulating how these relations function, um, but interestingly challenges the common myth, and one that drives me potty, uh, that the, the dog is not a child substitute. Um, she alternately considers how human, animal, um, human and animal are shaped by the experiences of cohabitation, so back and forth. Um, this is something explored from a UK perspective, so quite a rare UK study, by Charles and Davies, who found that categorical boundaries between animal and human are more permeable and complex. So this is pertinent to our study, and also the work of um, Buca from the US, 
on the potentiality of dog walking to facilitate human-human relationships, although they do acknowledge the danger of clique formation, which I'll return to in a moment. So, considering leisure in the everyday, there's no time to provide a potted history of the theory of leisure, so merely to frame the study and being aware that not everybody in the room is from a leisure background. Notions of leisure and what it entails has been a contested question. There is the view that leisure is left over from what, when work duties are completed and when we have free time. So in this school of thought, leisure and work are seen um, as hand in hand. Um, but this um, notion has been problemised in a sort of post-modern, uh, brackets, <laughs> post-modern um, society. But it has been accepted early on in the study of leisure that leisure and identity are interrelated. For example, Stanley Parker in 1976, he deals with the link between um, identity and leisure choice and the search for meaningful fun. Um, whilst this is critiqued by Rojek, who's one of the main kind of authors of this idea of postmodern leisure and destabilising leisure notions, he acknowledges that leisure pursuits are the most telling indication of who a person really is. Ken Roberts, um, who's at University of Liverpool, um, he more recently develops this point and challenges the notion that leisure is a site, and he challenges the notion that leisure is a site that cuts across identity constructs. He says leisure introduces often temporary identity embellishments. It enables people to express individuality while simultaneously aligning themselves with a particular lifestyle group, but all this while retaining basic core identities. So he maintains that access to leisure choices still remains unequal. The idea of serious leisure is something that comes up in dog sports in particular. Stebbing coined the term, um, and it's about profound, long-lasting um, leisure, which takes skill. Um, so things like um, agility and fly ball are things that get talked about um, serious leisure. Um, the study will be build, building on this body of knowledge um, around leisure, but indeed at the individual level, how do people define their own leisure practice? And in relation to dog ownership, it's anticipated that this will reveal some interesting new debates. In particular, is dog walking seen as leisure or chore? Um, and this is where debates around everydayness is essential. There's been a focus on the importance of everyday experience in the social sciences. The everyday is far from unimportant. It is not about routine and monotonous activity taking us from morning to night. Um, linked to the notion of everyday is that of mundanity and ordinariness. Sandy well claims, and I quote, the ordinary has been systematically denigrated in the very act of being theorised as everyday life. And what is ordinary is subject to the orders that be. So what we're arguing here is that the ordinary is far from being apolitical um, and unimportant. That the everyday, um, that the space of the everyday is where we perform our identities. It's where we challenge stereotypes and there are moments of resignification. And this all links into the themes outlined um, in the... the the literature around personal life, identity distinctions and well-being. Okay, so some initial thoughts. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a few of the interviews that I've done, but also some of the um, reflections. So whilst the days to a um, collection is still ongoing, I can present some initial thoughts. I'm going to look at the idea of animal-human relations, the idea of the post-human and questions of ethics, and briefly, if I've got time, human-human relations, because that's the kind of thing that most people seem to be interested in. I'm also going to refer to some reflections that myself and Tom um, wrote the same day. We, we went away and we wrote our own reflections. Many previous studies have focused on the relationship that forms between owner and pet. This study is no different in its observation of the importance of this. In initial discussions, Tom and I talked about how we construct notions of what we think our dogs need and want. We imagine their desires and we even invent personalities. Tom speaks of his dogs as pampered pooches. And I mock his choice of a small dog as not a proper dog. <laughs> in his reflection, Tom states, whilst, for example, I am forced to have my hair cut by my wife in my living room, Lizzie and Ruby attend their very own personal groomer. <laughs> Being King Charles Spaniels, the construction of their needs is based on received wisdom of the breed. And whilst Ralph, a collie, I construct his needs based on the idea of his breed. And um, in my reflection... Um, <laughs> Ralph is idiosyncratic to say the least. He's scared of thunder, most dogs are. He's also scared of hose pipes, the clothes maiden, and he's taken a weird dislike to high fives. You'll hear collie owners talking about collie wobbles. Um, quickly, I'm going to talk about Buster. 
Now, the relationship between Buster and his owners is framed by running. Um, Dan Fell runs, and Dan says, I take him fell running, which he absolutely loves. How do we know Buster absolutely <laughs> loves fell running is my question. There has been a lot of literature around the agency of dogs. Um, but how, you know, we kind of construct this need of what we think our dogs want. Um, Dan and Anne-Marie express guilt, possibly, about not taking him on a walk, which is quite common, but then thinks, well, we went on a 10-mile run the other day. Um, so with this, this presumption that, that Buster loves that thrill of running, as many, I don't know, runners do. Um, so Gracie and Ron. Um, Gracie is a rescue dog, and um, Gracie and Ron's, um, and Ron's partner, Ron, bear with me, uh, <laughs> is very much shaped around the past of Gracie. So whilst Ron is allowed to put Gracie's collar on her, Ron, his partner, has to chase around the garden to perform the same task. Um, and there's also this kind of need that came out, and it's something we experienced with Ralph, is this desire for the dog to love us. So Ron's partner, Ron, will give her treats, and he's, just, he's taught her to beg, which is undesirable behaviour, because he wants love from the dog. And we often say, do you think the puppy is cross with us? <laughs> um, so, um, we imbue the, um, our pets with the ability to have steaming human emotions. Yet, as Fox warns us, it is nearly, it's dangerous to merely rely on the idea of anthropomorphism as a way of explaining this. She explains it as a lived intersubjectivity. The question here is a moral one. Can we find a new way to talk about the relationship between human and dog? I even hesitate when I write about dogs and their owner. I suddenly became uncomfortable with this language choice. On reading Haraway's The Companion Species Manifesto, the study on dog-human relations, very much independent by a radical feminist ontology, she states, we need other nouns and pronouns in, um, for the kin genres of companion species, just as we did and still do for the spectrum of genders. Um, she reminds us that there's a historic historicity in the relationship with animals imbued in every encounter we make, and this is where the value of the post-human is arrived upon here. The dog and human relationship is ambivalent and, one, ambivalent and one which boundaries between concepts are iterative and performative. The destabilization, destabilizing of the categories of human and animal allow us to interrogate the experience of dog walking and dog, le dog leisure activities in a fundamental different way. The questions of response ability is raised by Brown and Dilly and that the dog walking experience is about co-knowing, a phrase echoed by Haraway that human and dog relationship is about mutually becoming. There's interesting and emerging work by Dashpa, um, who's also at Leeds Met, in relation to horse-human relations. And she calls um, this, um, the practice involves two sentient beings, both horse and human, they are sentient beings. The leisure experience is not just that of the human, but it's depend on interactive. This also feeds into the notions of responsible dog ownership, an acceptable and responsible dog walking behaviour. This then fits into wider agendas of local councils, environment agencies, dog charities and the like. Really quickly, I'll just talk about human-human um, relations. So there's this idea that the, um, dog walking will, be, will encourage sociability, but actually it can also discourage sociability. So if you happen to get the wrong dog, you then cannot speak to those people. So for example, with Ralph, I can never speak to the people that own Ralph's nemesis. That's what the dog is called in our head, because they don't get on. So that's an area we're going to develop. Um, so the next steps is to complete the primary data collection. Um, and we anticipate that further research, once we've grasped some of the key areas, worth exploring in more detail. In particular, I would like to develop the method of data collection and take walks with participants and really understand the human-human dog-dog relations that I mentioned. The use of walking interviews has been established within the domain of sociological and geographical research. The idea would be to accompany dog owners on their usual walking routines at their usual times, and the embodied aspects of dog walking and the appreciation and understanding of how the space inhabited by the walker and their pet influence the experience will illuminate the subject further. In the meantime, I hope this paper has been thought-provoking and allowed an insight into the world that I am inhabiting and I'm sure many of you inhabit as dog owners. It is a complex relationship and it's precisely the mundanity and the everydayness, and I can't stress this enough, this is where I'm coming from, this is what makes it worth researching. So I will end with a little vignette of Ralph on uh, um, Robin Hood's Bay. So the mornings are much lighter now, in, in which in dog walking terms make things much easier. In the winter we had the ritual of getting up, showering, getting dressed, including dog walking socks. 
um, pulling on the wellies. My wellies have a hole in as well. Um, a giant eider down coat, which John calls me Arsene Wenger when I wear. <laughs> Getting Ralph into his high vis. Um, and all the while, Ralph woofs a lot. Yes, we've made some mistakes with Ralph, but I know that a dog is a dog. I feel bad we don't have a large garden for him, but we live on the edge of the river and also walking distance to park. He is awesome, and I have no qualms about being a crazy dog lady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. <laughs>